What a blessing to be here tonight. There was a policeman uh, flying down the highway about 100 mile an hour chasing a car. When all of a sudden the uh, man in the speeding car, he finally pulled over on the side of the road and the policeman got out and he said to this man, he said, look, your taillight was out. Why in the world were you trying to escape? And the man said to the policeman, he said, well, last week my wife ran off with the policeman and I was afraid you're trying to bring her back. <laughs> I want to talk to you tonight about fear. Now that's the only funny part in this uh, message tonight because fear is a very serious subject. I read on the internet the 10 top things that men fear, 10 top things that men fear. Number one, public speaking, a fear of heights, flying, spiders, snakes, needles, mice, enclosed places, thunder and lightning, and the fear of death. But I disagree with their conclusion. I believe that those things are legitimate, but the number one fear of all fears is the fear of man. Anthrophobia. Anthro means man. Phobia means fear, the fear of man. Now, Proverbs chapter 29 gives us some insight into this. Read it out loud with me, please. The fear of man bringeth a snare. Read that one more time. The fear of man. All right, the fear of man brings a snare. It sets a trap. And this trap of fear will catch you, it will bind you, and it will destroy you. Now, what is the fear of man? Well, the fear of man is valuing the opinions of men greater than the opinion of God. The fear of man is valuing the favor of men more than the favor of God. The fear of man is desiring approval from men more than approval from God. Most of us sitting here, if we are not over it, we still have an approval addiction. Let me ask you tonight, whose eyes control you? Whose eyes control you? Whose words control you? You know what the fear of man is? The fear of man is a disease to please. The fear of man has been described as the disease to please. It's an inordinate desire for approval, a man-fearing spirit. Now, fear of man is just Bible language for insecurity. That's what it is. It's insecurity. Now, basing your security on the approval of others is not healthy. Deriving acceptance and deriving your identity from your fellow fallible human beings is not the way to go. Let me say tonight, it's more important for you to feel comfortable in your own skin than try to get other people to feel comfortable with your skin. It's more important for you to feel comfortable in your own skin than trying to get everybody else to feel comfortable with your skin. Now, insecure people, uh, they derive their personal worth from the attitudes of others. They're discouraged when people don't agree with them. And they're forever comparing themselves with others. You know, when you're snared by the fear of man, you see men big and you see God small. When men are big... And when God is small, you got the fear of man. And you, see, you know, you can care so much about what people think about you, it can bind you from fulfilling your God-given assignment. Why? Because men look bigger than God. And I want to say that when you're more concerned about your public appearance before men than your actual condition before God, you're snared by the fear of man. Amen. Leonard Ravenhill said, the man who is intimate with God is not intimidated by man. The man who is intimate with God is not intimidated by man. Now, uh, people crave approval. They want to fit in. They, they dress funny. You ever drive it down the street and you see some guy got his pants, his, his pants down to about right here, got his colorful drawers up to here. And by the way, the reason they call it underwear is because it's supposed to be covered by outerwear. <laughs> And the same guy's got a stocking hat on and his shirt off and it's 100 degrees. Now, what is he doing? I guess he's trying to fit in with who I don't know, but uh, it's the fear of man. Now, let me say something to you. How many remember back in uh, some of our days, how many remember bell bottoms? How many had bell bottoms? <laughs> I remember denim jackets. 
How many had a big wide belt? White shoes. How many had a medallion? <laughs> hey, don't be too hard on the millennials. We look just as stupid to our parents as they do to us, all right? <laughs> you look like an idiot, sir. That's all you're doing. You just look like an idiot. <laughs> now look, pride is not just thinking we're better than others. Pride is desiring for other people to think us better than what we really are. The fear of man is when you have an undue concern about what people think about you, what other people say about you, and what other people do to you. I want to assure you, you would not be worried at all about what people thought about you if you knew how seldom they ever thought about you. <laughs> Nobody's sitting around thinking about you all day long. Get over it. You're the only dude that thinks about you all the time. <laughs> Nobody else thinking about you. I mean, get real. <laughs> you know, the fear of man brings a snare. Now, I had uh, surgery at John Hopkins uh, uh, Hospital in uh, Baltimore. Well, after surgery, I uh, got ready to come home. So I had on these uh, gym shorts, these long gym shorts. I had on dark socks, sandals, gym shorts, a Hawaiian shirt. I had a catheter tube running down the leg of those gym shorts, and I had a catheter bag in my hand. I stumbled out of that place. I mean, I was in bad shape, and I, I was stumbling out like this right here. And you know, even the little children, when they looked at me, they had pity. And they, <laughs> they would look up like this guy's got one foot in the grave, and they would open the door. And, we got in the car and we we're heading home, so we stopped at Chick-fil-A in Harrisonburg. So here I am getting out of the car, sandals, dark socks, gym shorts, Hawaiian shirt, catheter tube, catheter bag. I told my family, I'm going to go into Chick-fil-A and I'm going to go around from table to table with that bag and say, top off your tea. More lemonade. Strawberry punch, <laughs> depending on what day it was. And my son, my son Stephen was with me 15 feet behind me. <laughs> Embarrassed, full of the fear of man right there. Yeah, I know. Full of the fear. Man up. <laughs> but, but how many know the older you get that uh, comfort trumps appearance? How many know that? <laughs> you really don't care how you look. But you know the fear of man is a, it's a misdirected fear and it's the wrong kind of fear and it's a gateway to bigger problems. Now, what, the fear of, what does the fear of man do? What the fear of man does? Let's just think for a moment about the fallout from the fear of man. Now, the fear of man grieves the Holy Spirit. I said, the fear of man grieves the Holy Spirit. The fear of man deflates the human spirit. And the fear of man deadens the conscience. Let me give you a few things tonight. Number one, the fear of man robs a man of courage. The fear of man robs a man of courage. Alvin York said, the fear of God makes a hero, but the fear of man makes a coward. You know what courage is? Courage is being true to who you are when others want you to be somebody else. Everybody wants you to be as peculiar as they are. And y'all think that other groups are peculiar? Can I say, tell you something? You're just as peculiar to them as they are to you. You're not the standard Caucasian, sir. Southern gentleman, whoever you are, get over yourself. Everybody wants you to be like them, think like them, act like them, talk like them, sing like them, dress like them. She, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, remember when they were commanded to worship that idol and they refused to worship that image? And they said, our God is able uh, to deliver, but if not, we're not going to worship this image. And they got thrown into a fiery furnace. They didn't bow. They didn't budge. They didn't burn. And they were not afraid of the threats and the taunts. You know, Adrian Rogers said that Jesus didn't come to get you out of trouble. He came to get in trouble with you. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Better to be in the fire with the fourth man than out of the fire without him. The Lord is on my side. I'll not fear what man shall do unto me. You know, the three Hebrew children, they were not afraid to lose their life, but church members in America are afraid they're going to lose their jobs. Government workers, corporate workers, they tell them to shut up about Jesus, and they shut up. But the early Christians couldn't help but speak about the things they had seen and they had heard. And if your job means more to you than your God, you know nothing of the fear of God. I'll just say that to you. Fear of man robs you of courage. Number two, the fear of man silences the prophetic voice. We're living in a day when evangelical and fundamental Christianity, there's a hatred of correction, and we've been robbed of the prophetic voice. You know it says there in John 12, nevertheless, the chief rulers also, many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Nobody wants to be cast out of the synagogue. Everybody can call out sin in, in the other camp. But very few people will call out sin in their own camp or in their own church. You listen to me tonight. I'm sick of the left wingers uh, giving down the road to the legalist on the right. And I'm sick, sick of the right wingers giving it down to the uh, crowd on the left hand side of the road. There's enough sin in your church, in your camp, in your group. You don't need to call out nobody else's sin. Why don't you call out your own sin? And the reason our churches are full of crooks and con men and adulterers and all kinds of junk is because the prophetic voice has been silenced in the house of God. And I'm telling you, brother, in the New Testament, there's a lot of correction that was going on. So we're afraid to confront the in-house extremes. And there's extremes in every group. People saying stupid stuff. And if you can't back up your convictions with the word of God, don't tell me about them. I don't want to hear it. Now, what's more important to you? Approval from your peers or approval from God? What's more approval to you? Acceptance from your culture or acceptance from Christ? And what's more important? Approval from your family or approval from Almighty God? Whose eyes are controlling you? Whose, whose words are controlling you? You know when you have the fear of man, you just sit silently while other people get slandered. So here's a pastor being attacked normally by some big mouth woman. And the deacons got their hands in the pocket like a bunch of neutered tomcats. Let me say something to you, sir. There's a time to get up on your feet and speak up for truth and right and come to the defense of injustice that's being happening in the house of God. What is wrong with us? What is wrong with us? It's almost like we've been so sensitized, feminized, sentimentalized. She. So the fear man immobilizes us when we should take action. The fear man gags us into silence when we should speak. There's a bunch of stuff acceptable in today's church that's not acceptable to the Lord. The fear of man is when you alter your beliefs to curry favor with the crowd you're talking to. You ever done that? Sure you have. We all have. Showing a favoritism toward people to gain approval. So you speak one group way to one group, go over here and talk another way to another group, and you overlook the extremes and excesses to save place. Remember how Nathan rebuked David in a direct confrontation when he said, Thou art the man. So you can be bold as a lion uh, in denouncing somebody else's sins, but be as silent as a lamb in, when you're talking about your own situation. Fear of man, what does it do? It enables corruption. The fear of man enables corruption. The fear of man is when you feel, you feel pressure from men and you feel pressure from your culture, but the fear of God is when you feel pressure from the Holy Spirit. Remember Aaron? How he had the fear of man... And he, he built this golden calf. So Moses is up on the hill somewhere and the Israelites said, make us gods to lead us. So Aaron ripped off the uh, earrings out of the men, which may have been a good move. And uh, he ripped those earrings out and he said he threw them in the oven and uh, out walked a calf. Remember this? That's exactly what he said. What a wimp. 
<laughs> and old Moses comes down with his face aglow with the glory of God. And the children of Israel rose up to play. You listen to me tonight. 23,000 fornicators were struck dead by Almighty God because fear of man enables corruption. Our churches are full of sin. Half our hearts are full of sin. Am I telling you the truth or not? Could it be a bunch of self-righteous prigs? Brother, we'd be better off to get in the dust and own up and try to get some cleansing from God. Enables corruption. Aaron was a leader, but his choices corrupted the nation. Now this brings me to this point of the transgendered preaching that's going on in the United States. When I was in Bible school, if you bar hopped and lied about it, you'd get kicked out. Now the president of the college has no repercussions. How have we gotten to this place when nobody in authority has the guts to confront sin with the desire to bring restoration? The only person who was qualified to cast a stone didn't. Now, I ain't talking about casting stone, but I'm talking about this is serious. This kind of stuff, it, it, it enables corruption. Uh, you, you're going to hear more about hell on television than you will in the average Baptist church. The only time church people hear the word hell is when somebody has a verbal slip at the ball game. Let me ask you preachers a question. You ever read the New Testament? You ever read Luke 16? You ever read what Jesus had to say about this? Have you been so influenced by psychology and positivity and all the rest of it? And I'm not for being negative and wearing people out. You know that. I'm not in favor of that. But brother, there's a place to proclaim the truth of God to men as they are. And there is such a place called hell, whether we want to believe it or not. Some of your children are going to hell. And if the Holy Ghost doesn't come and touch our churches, our grandchildren are going to populate hell. It enables the fear of man. It, 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 it enables corruption. Now, why did the, a Methodist and the Presbyterian and half the Baptist, uh, now they're talking about uh, gay marriage, uh, homosexual pastors. Uh, how did this happen? Uh, what, what is going on? The fear of man has silenced preachers. Eternal damnation has been purged from the sermons. We're all worried about social justice. You better get concerned about divine justice, brother. I'm telling you, that's what we ought to be talking about. So direction in the ministry is not determined by what is taught, but by what you tolerate. Direction in the ministry is not determined just by what you teach, it's by what you tolerate. What you permit, you promote. What you don't correct, you condone. Silence is sanction. So we have this movement allegiance. We have this denominational loyalty. And, and the truth is, financial annuity is more popular than the authority of the Word of God. There's no nice way to put this. I, I can't think of a nice way to put it. Now, what about church members living in open sin? Well, we just got to love them, Brother Harold. You know, God's grace is so wonderful. God's love and God's grace have not taken hell out of existence. It's hard to have balance, isn't it? I mean, it's made near impossible to be objective. Let's be honest here. If we either off on one side or off on the other side, but the Word of God's right down the middle, and there's truth and grace, brother. Now, now, now what, what, about, what about failure to discipline sin in the church leads to more sin in the church? One man said, when church discipline goes out the window, Christ walks out the door. Now, if you've got members living in moral sin, my recommendation is deal with it or get out of the ministry. I don't know about you, but I already got enough to give an account for. I don't want to stack up any, anything else. 
Stop asking God for revival and start repenting. National Day of Prayer. Going to get the Muslims, Catholics, Hindus, everybody under the sun in there, Rainbow Coalition. We're going to have a National Day of Prayer. Do you think God's impressed with this trash? Prayers to God the Father in the name of Jesus through the Holy Spirit, brother. And I'm telling you, that's the only prayer that God hears. God's got a controversy with, uh, with our generation. That's why there's been, been very little, very little uh, outpouring of God's spirit. It enables corruption. One thing that's worse than the fear of man is the fear of woman. And some of y'all, if you can't stick, stick a sock in Big Bertha's mouth, try politics. That's what you're fit for. Boy, you're really, you really being mean up there tonight, Brother Errol. You ever read any of the prophet? You ever read some of the stuff Jesus said? If Jesus was to come and clean out the church like he cleaned out the temple, somebody would say he was unchristlike. The fear of man promotes a critical spirit. It promotes a critical spirit. We've got to get beyond our style preferences. <laughs> if it doesn't sound like and look like my cultural norms, I'm going to write it off. Boy, is it easy to criticize people who are different. Now, if they don't follow my preferred way, then they're wrong. A fellow said to me the other day, if it's not an expositional sermon, Brother Harold, I ain't going to listen to it. Well, he wouldn't even listen to the Sermon on the Mount. wouldn't even listen to Peter's Pentecost sermon where 3,000 got saved. How many people got saved last year listening to your expositional sermons? We've got to get over our style preferences. I was at a event and there was this millennial speaking. And I'm sitting down there and listening and I said to my son, I said, uh, hey son, is this good? Is this good? Oh, yeah, this is good. This is great, great, great. Okay. So I'm sitting there thinking, my bell ain't getting rung. You know, this is not appealing to me. And I said to my son a little later, I says, uh, hey, is this connecting? He said, yeah, Dad, it's connecting. I said, okay. And I just want to say this. That guy wasn't there to connect with me. He was there to connect with the kids 25 and under. And some of us need to get a little larger in our outlook and understand if somebody can connect with somebody we can't, let's praise God for it and, and, and recognize the grace of God, whoever's got it, even if they're a little different from you. Go ahead and say a Baptist amen on that point right there. You know, when the present generation goes to war with the previous generation, we're sure to lose the current generation. When the previous generation goes to war with the current generation, we're sure to lose the future generation. My style preferences are not Bible absolutes. Repeat that out loud with me. My style preferences are not Bible absolutes. Say that again. My style preferences... Is that right or wrong? Some of us need to lighten up and some of us need to tighten up. <laughs> so when we judge ourselves by others, it's not wise. The fear of man hinders kingdom advance. The fear of man hinders kingdom advance. Why have conservative churches become museums and geriatric wards? Why have we become so ineffective in connecting and reaching this current generation? I'll tell you one reason. I believe the Spirit of God has grieved off half our churches. We think we dress right, we look right, we got the right Bible, we do all this kind of stuff, and we think this is somehow impressing God. And we got this entrenched, man-made distinctness. Now listen, guys, ain't nobody got the permission to preach like this but me, all right? I'm in charge. Don't you do it. I'm doing it. I'm taking care for all of us tonight. <laughs> you know what's wrong with it? No humility. No correctability. Let me tell you what's wrong with the fundamentalist churches I go to, most of them. They ain't an ounce of spiritual hunger within a hundred miles. They didn't hurt at all and they just hear the same stuff rehashed over and over. There's no teachability. There's no hunger to hear from God. 
The fear of man has paralyzed the work of God. Uh, this over-the-top reverence for human hierarchies and customs. The slavish compliance to human traditions. John Newton was a slave trader. Can you imagine? He got set, found out of the grace of God. He wrote that song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. But listen to me. After he was converted, he kept on trading slaves for six years. Somebody asked him, how in the world could you do this after your conversion? And he said, it was just the culture of the day. Can I say something to you? Some of the stuff that we grew up with in our, in our norm, cultural norms is just as bizarre to the word of God as trading slaves. Whoever dreamed that the people most opposed to ritualism would become the most ardent ritualist on the planet. We need to get over some of this mess. Quit trying to save the nation, brother. Just try to save some souls and ask God, the Holy Ghost, what you can do to connect with the young people in your town. I go to churches. I was in a church. They have 65,000 kids in a university, and not a single one of them was in the house of God. Uh, the Sunday I was there, and there's no attempt. There's no desire. There's no burden. There's no teachability to inquire of God on what to do to reach this generation. Quit viewing these people as enemies. I uh, quit Quit thinking of them badly because they like Bernie. But if they fall, fall in love with Jesus, they'll get straightened out on their politics. Say amen right there. See, amazing. Fear man is a vision killer. I said the fear man's a vision killer. Half of us have been sitting around scared to move on what we feel like we ought to do because of our alma mater. Forget your alma mater. It'll be liberal in 25 years anyhow. Forget about it. Got nothing to do with anything. Listen, the men who impact their world have declared independence from the expectations of others. You were born an original. Don't die a copy. Brother, you be what God made you to be. You do what God called you to do. You say what God called you to say. You don't make any difference what anybody thinks. Ten spies came back with an evil report about the promised land. <laughs> so why did the children of Israel wander in the wilderness for 40 years? It was the fear of man. Wall cities, opposition, giants. Ten spies stripped the faith out of the Israelites. The ten spies wanted to go back to Egypt. But if Israel had listened to Caleb, things would have been different. And I want to tell you something, brother. Caleb was a young man in an old body. I like that guy. I like that guy. Man, he's the only one had any fire. He's the only one didn't need a hormone shot in that bunch. And you know, Caleb, his body was in the wilderness, but his heart was in the promised land. He said, man, it's a, brother Moore, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. We're well able to take the land up at once. Let's go and get 85 years old. Must have been on Barley Green or Starbucks or something. I don't know what he was talking about. <laughs> but Israel listened to ten faithless cowards. Listening to the wrong voices can be fatal. They perished in the wilderness. Please listen to me. Listen to me. I'm 63 years old. I've had a few health challenges. Some of y'all have too. Can I tell you one? One of these days we're checking out and we don't know when it's going to be. Some of us, there's people that was here last year that's not here uh, tonight because they, they've gone into eternity. My friend Jerry Hill is in eternity tonight. Stanley Long is in eternity tonight. Some of your friends are in eternity tonight. You might be in eternity tonight. You better not have a bunch of regrets. You better launch out and just do what God told you to do the way God told you to do it. Quit worrying about all this. Now listen, listen. The, when the fear walks in, faith walks out. Number, number next, the fear of man smothers your witness. Fear man smothers you with you. You know, fear man will keep you from doing right and lead you to doing wrong. Peter, he denied the Lord three times, cursed and swore. He was afraid he was going down with Jesus, warming at the enemy's fire. Not one disciple spoke up for Jesus. We'd have done the same thing if we'd been there. Fear of man is a fear of rejection and reprisal. David, the shepherd boy, went up against Goliath. Everybody else was terrified, but David wasn't afraid. I, I, I mean, all the soldiers were intimidated by this giant, 
uh, Goliath, but David had killed a lion and a bear, and he wasn't afraid to tackle Goliath. You know, David's brothers thought that Goliath was too big to fight. But David thought he was too big to miss. <laughs> I met a guy that he raises chameleons. You ever seen a chameleon? It'll turn whatever color you put it on. You put it on a blue shirt, it turns blue. Put it on a red shirt, it turns red. Put it on a patchwork work. A patchwork quilt and it'll strip its gears. You know, I don't know what to do about that situation. <laughs> Anybody here ever been afraid to stand out and speak out when you had an opportunity to speak up for Jesus? You ever done that? I've done that. Nothing has robbed Christians of more witnessing opportunities than the fear of man. Boldness is one of the evidences of being filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, some of us, we have ESP, extra spiritual perception. We can look at people and predict who's going to be saved. <laughs> that guy, he, prob he probably not interested, you know. Well, you know what the problem is? We're choked with fear. That's, that's what it is. Well, I can't give the gospel to them, Brother Harold. It might run them off. They're already going to hell. They ain't nothing to lose. Well, I'm going to have to get my heart right and get my act together before I can wait. If you wait till you get straightened out all the way, you ain't never going to say nothing. <laughs> Better to do something imperfectly than to do nothing at all. You'll never lead a soul to Christ unless you try. Peter learned the power of the blood. He had denied the Lord three times. He had cursed and he swore. Uh, but he got clear in the upper room. I like that upper room. He got in there, got right, got real, got honest. Talked to God from the bottom of his heart, up with 120 of them, you know. Stood up at Pentecost, brimming with confidence. You who crucified the Son of God. Good night. And man, he thundered out. And he forgot all about his denial and his failure. You know, God doesn't want you living under a cloud of guilt and condemnation. I'm sick of the Catholic Baptist. I'm sick of all this depravity preaching with no deliverance preaching. Listen to me. If a guy only talks about depravity but hardly ever mentions deliverance, it is imbalanced, unbiblical preaching. Of course you talk about the curse, but buddy, you better emphasize the cure. Say amen, somebody. God's grace is greater than your failure. Christ's blood is stronger than your guilt. God's mercy is bigger than your mess. And buddy, when you mess up, fess up. And if you don't feel forgiven, just keep on thanking him until you do feel forgiven. We got to learn the power of the blood. Number next, the fear of man corrupts our families. Well, we're afraid of what our family members will say. I never took a vote about my children when my children were small about whether we was going to church or not. Well, I, I, I just don't want them to be hypocrites. I want them to be their decision. Why don't you get off? I'm, 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 watch, watch the restraint I'm exercising right now. Somebody asked the policeman, when should a, children get a child get a smartphone? The policeman's answer was, when the parents are ready for them to start viewing pornography. You can't handle it. You think they can? Fear man sends people to hell. No sin has sent more people to hell than the fear of man. Jesus spoke about a man fearing spirit. He said, fear not them which kill the body, but which are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body. In hell. You know, you know, the idea now is God is too good to send anybody to hell. And men are too good for God to send to hell. Jesus said, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. You know the fear man keeps people from getting saved. You know why some of y'all here tonight never had a new birth encounter? You're worried about what people think. Man, I was in Clay, West Virginia one time. We were having a meeting. Good to be in town when God is. 
We're having a meeting. There's a man in the church, family man, church man, moral man, business man, good man, but a lost man. He stood up one night and here's what he said. He said, I've known for years, I've never been born again. But he said, I've been afraid about what you people would think if I admitted that I was not saved. But he said, tonight I realized for the very first time that at the judgment seat, not only will you know that I was lost, the whole universe is going to know I'm lost. And he broke down in tears. He said, if you're going to know it then, he said, you just might as well know it now. I'm a lost soul and I need to be saved. Yeah. Wept his way right into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm telling you. Listen, if you confess Jesus, he'll confess you. You deny him, he'll deny you. That's what he said. Sends people to hell. Then the fear of man chokes personal holiness. The fear of man chokes personal holiness. The fear of man makes you afraid of being exposed. You're afraid. It takes the fight out of you. Listen to me, men. If you're not willing to confront your own sin bent, you will never be free. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. The fear of man caused Abraham to lie about his wife and say she, she was his sister. The fear of man caused Elijah to run from his life, for his life from Jezebel. And he called down fire, slew the prophets. You know all of this stuff, a courageous man, but trembling in fear. Uh, the fear of man chokes personal holiness. Now there's people sitting in this building tonight struggling with every sin known to man. Can I just say this to you? We all come from a dysfunctional family. Some of us are obsessed with worry. Some of us are addicted to appetite. Some of us are hooked on pornography. Some abuse alcohol. Some are controlled by the opinions of others. An approval addiction. What would Dr. So-and-so think? What would King Jesus say? Think? That's, that's what you better be thinking about. Quit worrying about somebody else's opinion. Come clean. Here's, let, let, let me give you a little personal testimony here. Here's the way to get clean. Confide in somebody. Confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another. Cancer came to our house. My wife handled it great. She handles everything great. Anybody, anybody else got a wife like that? Can handle anything? And you can't handle nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Fell into a pit. Oh, it was an awful dark pit. Some of you boys came to my house. Some of y'all came to my house and sat with me and listened to me. I, my voice was so bad I couldn't hardly even talk. Prayed with me. I thank God I got friends sitting here in this building that I can confess to, confide in, and draw counsel from. Your eternity is more important than your reputation. You listen to me tonight. You're not the only borderline reprobate in your congregation. Did y'all hear what I said? You're not the only borderline pervert in your church. The only difference is you know you and you don't know them. And how in the world did it ever come to the point when we, we're going to have prayer meeting? Well, pray for Aunt Susie. She got infected, toe fungus. And, and pray for my third cousin 15 states away and traveling mercies. And why don't somebody get up in the prayer meeting and say, I wish somebody would pray for me. I'm struggling with out of control worry. I'm, 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 I'm controlled by depression. Uh, my depravity is overwhelming. I need some grace. Can somebody help me? You need to resurrect your prayer meeting in your church and get off of this problem-based stuff. Get into some God-glorifying stuff. And by the way, can I just say this? It's about time some conservative churches had a baptism of the joy of the Holy Ghost come upon them and rejoice in the Lord a little bit. I'm just here to tell you, brother, we're dead as 4 o'clock in the morning. I ain't talking about putting on nothing. But I'm telling you, I've had enough joy in my heart for the last month or so. If I gave away half of it, y'all could all have a good full dose and I'd still have a plenty. I'm just, I'm just here to tell you. Now, I ain't always in a season like that. Thank God when them seasons come, amen. And I'm telling you, walking with a clean heart is good. 
And I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a secret. You need to learn the secret of a quick recovery. Buddy, if you mess up, if you fail in your mind or you, something pops up on your phone, just admit it, confess it, admit it, quit it, and forget it, and get up and start thanking God right on the spot. You ain't got to stay down, Brother Nolan. Hallelujah, you got up. You got up. Praise God, you got up. It's wonderful. Now, temptation is common to man. Lust is universal. You're a sexual being. God made you that way. Quit apologizing for it. Get you a hot wife and go for it. Amen. I'm just, I'm, I'm telling you. Quit spiritualizing everything. Sensualism is idolatry. Sensuality is something God put in us. You're not alone in your struggle. And purity is a lifelong struggle battle. Lifelong, lifelong. <laughs> so uh, refuse to make peace with the sin that so easily besets you. You know what some of you are thinking? I don't think I could be saved and struggle with sin as fiercely as I do. Anybody ever thought that? How in the world can I be saved, man? These, 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 what, what is this? Where, what is this coming from? Even when you're not trying to do it, you're, I mean, what is this? And you're thinking, well, I probably can't even be saved. And, and, and how can I have such a fierce struggle with sin? You feel alone. You feel ashamed. <laughs> you feel dirty. And you don't want to cave in, but you cave in. And you promise God. As a teenager, I said, God, if I ever sin again, if I'm, if I'm, if God, if I'm ever going to sin again, I just pray you'd kill me right now. How many of you know God didn't answer that prayer? <laughs> you know, some of y'all are afraid you're going to get found out. I have a liberating announcement. You got found out at Calvary where Jesus took your sin in his own body on the cross. <laughs> you got found out, glory be to God, and he dealt with it to the Father's satisfaction. And you ain't got nothing to tell him that's going to shock him or surprise him. And he's just waiting for you to get honest and to come clean. Quit hiding in the darkness. Darkness is no good. Isolation is no good. Quit hiding in the silence and seclusion. Bring your sins to the light. Now listen, if you're not desperate enough to get real, you're not going to get delivered. I had a 72-year-old man come up to me. He said, Earl, there's just one sin I can't get victory over. And you know, I thought, dear God, I don't want to be 72 and saying something like that. God help us. God help me. God help you. You say, well, we believe in the reform. We belong in the reform is unanimous, George. Yes, we all belong in the reform. The, the principles of discipleship in life in Christ. Now listen, the body of Christ ought to be spiritual enough to handle people with their problems. Young people don't even know whether they're a man or a woman. I ain't making fun of nobody here. The, the environment they've grown up in and the wimpy men they've been around, no wonder they've all been out of shape and don't know what's going on. We ought to be able to help people, listen to people. People have same-sex uh, attraction. God can help them too. Such were some of you, but you're washed, but you're clean. Man, I like the gospel. It's good news. Amen. Now listen, confess your faults one to another. Bear one another's burdens. Some of y'all need to huddle up with some uh, saint of God and get real. If you don't get honest, you're never going to get healed. Now the fear of man has stumbled the best of saints. And nobody on earth is immune from this insidious phobia. Now look around. I want you to look around. Look around the building right now. Just look around. Everybody you're looking at 
has a phobia of some sort, a dysfunction, a dysfunction of some sort, or an addiction of some sort. Look around. You know, some of us are glad that ours are not as obvious or as bad as others. Well, they are as bad. There's only one antidote to the fear of man. That's the fear of God. The fear of man is the beginning of bondage. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. John Witherspoon said, it is only the fear of God that can deliver us from the fear of man. You know, when you have the fear of God, you don't worry about what other people are thinking. But what we need tonight is a baptism of godly fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Hey. So, perfect love drives out the fear of man. Having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. The fear of God is the only good fear. And the fear of God is a healthy fear. It's a healing fear. It's a freeing fear. And people that fear God pay no attention to the public opinion polls. <laughs> they only want to hear that word. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Read this text out loud with me. The fear of man. The fear of man's a trap. Brings a snare. But whoever puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. God can deliver you from that trap and make you triumphant. Listen to me. He can break the bondage of the fear of man and make you more than a conqueror. Now I want you to consider some questions tonight. Tonight we have much to pray about in our prayer groups. So I would encourage you to answer those questions and do whatever you need to do to overcome the fear of man. I've struggled with the fear of man my whole life. My confidence, no, this is the truth. And um, I'm learning the way of grace. Now, if you want to get freed up, you're going to have to get desperate and drastic. 
Some of us need to cut off some hands, pluck off some feet, pluck out some eyes. That's what our prayer time is going to be tonight. So huddle up with your group, wherever you're going to do it, get with them, have at it. And let's, uh, let's, get, let's get honest, let's come clean, let's get cleansed by the blood of Jesus.